Good morning, everyone. So we're going to pick back up here in chapter 10 today. So a couple of equations we're working with here, PV is equal to nRT. We might remember that moles is N. That would be mass over molar mass. We could rewrite our PV expression is equal to M over molar mass times RT. And if we do a little bit of work to rearrange, we could you know, divide both sides by volume, multiply both sides by molar mass. So then we would have pressure times molar mass is equal to M over V RT. Or of course, M over V is density. So density relates to pressure, molar mass, and temperature. So this here would look like our density. So density M over V is equal to pressure, molar mass, over RT. So the main equations I think that we just need to make sure to know are, well, you know, the ideal gas law relating moles and molar mass. And then if we need to calculate a density, I think we just need to think about some of these rearrangements and relationships between um, molar mass and mass with moles and just doing some rearranging. So let's look at a couple of questions today. One of them is just calculating pressure given a certain quantity of gas in grams um, in a certain vessel at a certain temperature. And so here we can just use um, the ideal gas law. We could calculate moles either separately and throw it into PV is equal to nRT, or we could plug into an expression that looks like this here, where we're plugging the mass and the molar mass into one equation. It doesn't make much of a difference, but I think it's probably a little bit you know, simpler just to plug into pressure equal to MRT. So the mass times RT, and we'll divide by the molar mass, and then divide by the volume. So just rearranging the equation here for pressure. And then we also have choices on how we use um, the ideal gas constant. For example, I mentioned before the most common units that we use, and this is actually given on the final, that it's 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. We don't tend to give the units that are like the liter tor per mole Kelvin. You could look those up in a table, but usually you don't get that version with the test. So if we want to calculate this pressure in ATM and in tor, we'll simply calculate the pressure in ATM and then just convert it to tor after the problem's done. So we're going to use this version of R here. So we can sub in here our mass, 7.50 grams, times the ideal gas constant. I know writing units isn't students' favorite thing to do, but this is really a chapter where if we're just in tune with units and writing them in, we'll never make the mistake of like forgetting to convert to Kelvin because we see Kelvin here with our gas constant units. Everything in chapter 10 is going to Kelvin anyways. So we have to take 23 plus 273.15 to get it over to Kelvin. We're going to lose the 0.15 when we're rounding anyway, so we'll just add 273. So that'd be 296 Kelvin. I want to divide all this by the uh, molar mass of CH4. And so the molar mass would be the grams per mole. So that's 12.01 plus 1.008 times 4. So that's 16.04 grams per mole for the molar mass. And then the volume. We want it in liters because there are liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. We're provided liters, so that's good. And so we can start to see how our units are canceling. Grams cancel, liters cancels, Kelvin cancels. And then we're one over mole flips up to times moles. So if we flip this unit up here, it's moles in the numerator and then divide by moles in the denominator, so these moles are canceling here. And so the only unit not canceling is atmospheres. So our pressure comes out in unit ATM, and then we see that everything else is canceling out. So if we just calculate this out, I guess that our gas has a pressure of 4.54 ATM.
So I think it's important to think units. If we don't have any units here, we might not remember if it's 4.54 ATM, is it 4.54 TOR or some other unit, but it's ATM. And then we can remember our conversion is that one ATM is 760 TOR. This conversion here is usually given on the final. We'll send that out or you'll see it with some of the practice final materials but I'm pretty certain that the ATM to TOR conversion, we'll use it a bunch. I think we'll memorize it if we don't already have it memorized. But I get 3552, so we'll round that to 3550 TOR. Okay, so that's how we can just simply calculate a pressure given the mass of a gas, but we have to know what the gas is so we can know its molar mass to be able to plug into um, our ideal gas law equation here. So now when we're asked for the density of the gas, there's actually two ways I can think about the density here. One is to go through the equation we just wrote, that it's the pressure times the molar mass divided by RT. And so we can work that out here. Let's use the ATM pressure, since I'm going to use the ATM units of R. So we'll have 4.54 ATM times the molar mass of CH4, so 16.04 grams per mole. And then we'll div divide that by the gas constant. And then times the temperature. So Kelvin cancels, the per mole cancels, ATM cancels, the only thing not canceling is the grams per liter. So we get our density out here in units grams per liter. Let's calculate it. I get that it's 3.00 grams per liter. So that's one way we can calculate the density here is you going back to the equation that relates density to pressure, molar mass, temperature, and we can solve for um, the density. But we can also come back to the fact, if we want to calculate it a second way, so an alternate approach could have been to recognize that density is just mass over volume. We're provided the mass of 750 grams, or 7.50 grams, and then the volume of the container it was in was 2.50 liters. So we could actually have just calculated it from the information initially in the problem. That's just the M over V. And you can see, of course, this is equal to 3.00 as well. So we can calculate density a couple ways, or just remember the relationship of density is just mass to volume. We already knew the mass to volume. But we could, of course, said, well, we can relate it to the pressure, and then we can calculate it that way, or we can just plug into Ds M over V. Okay, so that's a few relationships of using the ideal gas law. So here's a problem here where we're going to um, generate gas from a chemical reaction. So um, once we see some chemistry, chemistry is like doing chemical reactions, right? So if we want to generate a gas, so we have sodium azide is the name of the reactant. It's a solid. When it's heated, it decomposes into sodium and N2. This actually used to be used to fill airbags. And I think some cars actually may still use this reaction. I think I noted before in class that the sodium tends to fly out with the nitrogen and then burns the balloon or burns the airbag and then burns the person. So it's not maybe the best thing to use to fill an airbag with. But, um, but this reaction here, um, you know, how many grams of this compound, sodium azide, NaN3, must be decomposed in order to fill a 50.0 liter airbag with 1.25 atmospheres of nitrogen at 22 degrees C by this reaction? So our first thought might be, well, how many moles of N2 need to be in that airbag? So what we might want to do is say, how many moles of N2 
are there in the airbag? And then our second step is going to be to think about how much of the reactants needed to produce that number of moles. So we have our moles of N2 that we calculate that are going to be in the airbag. How many moles of the reactant are needed to decompose in order to produce that quantity? So kind of a two-step problem here. So for the first step, or for the first part of the problem, is just using our ideal gas law. That we know the pressure we want the airbag to be, we know the temperature it's at, and then we know the volume it's going to fill to, so we can calculate the moles of nitrogen that we need to be present in the airbag. So we can just take the pressure that we want the airbag to be filled to, 1.25 ATM, 50 liters. And then we're going to divide by the gas constant. And that'd be 295 Kelvin. I guess the 0.15 comes into play with the 22.0. So it'd be 295.15 to 4 sig figs. We'll keep the 5 for now. So that's Kelvin. Kelvin cancels. Liter cancels. ATM cancels. 1 over moles flips up to the top to moles. So our units are working out here. And so let's calculate the number of moles. And now, do you guys expect, like even before we hit enter, you guys might be faster if you're calculating this with me than I am, but you might be thinking, you know, if you remember from Avogadro's law, at zero degrees C, a mole of gas occupies about 22.4 liters at one atmosphere. So we have a little bit more than an atmosphere. We have a little bit more than double that volume that a mole of gas occupies. So we're probably thinking this is around two to three moles of gas is like what I'm thinking. Sometimes if you're in tune, with like how large a number should be. If you forget to divide or multiply by the wrong number, you might pick up a mistake. Um, I got 2.58 moles, that looks about right. If I you know, maybe you know, multiply by the temperature instead of dividing, it would be massively different. So you might be able just to think of the range that value should be if you're looking at the math, um, just to be able to catch mistakes. But I get 2.58 moles. That's moles of the gas that's filling the airbag, which is the N2. Okay, so that's how many moles of nitrogen we want in the airbag, but the question's not asking for that number of moles. It's asking for how many grams of the NaN3 is needed to produce that quantity of nitrogen. And so we just have to use stoichiometry. So this is a, a fairly, I think, straightforward stoichiometry problem. Once we know we have so many moles here, we just need to work out the grams of the reactant that we need to produce it. So why don't I give you guys a chance to work on that review kind of problem of using stoichiometry to go back to calculate the grams of NaN3 and see if you can pick out the correct answer. I'll give you guys you know, maybe two minutes to work on that and I'll go through the answer after that.
All right, so let's take a look here. So again, we worked out the moles of nitrogen we needed to fill the air bag. So we're just using stoichiometry. For every three moles of nitrogen that we need to fill the air bag, we needed to start with two moles of NaN3 to decompose to produce the N2. And then one mole of NaN3 has a molar mass of 65.03 grams. And so doing, working that out, I got 112 grams. Just kind of a reminder, the final exam that's coming up is cumulative. So um, it's cumulative over some of the more major concepts out of the chapters. There will be a couple practice finals that get posted when we get closer to the final exam. But just to have in the back of our mind that we're going to have to revisit some of the earlier chapters to make sure you know, that we recall those when, you know, for the final. Hopefully, for some of the concepts, we've been building upon them. Like I think from chapter six forward, we you know, kind of have kept reinforcing those concepts. We'll see polarity and concepts of structure come back up in chapter 11 as well. So we'll see some built-in kind of review of some of these topics as we continue. As we also get to the end of the class, the last lecture, maybe even the last two lectures, we'll have um, some review in class two. Okay, so let's get into uh, having more than one gas present in a container. Um, the atmosphere is a good example of that, where we have nitrogen and oxygen, the primary components um, of our atmosphere. Argon's also about 1% of our atmosphere. So if two gases are, um, that do not react or combine in a container, then they act as if they're alone in the container. So they just act as separate particles. Um, we mentioned before that would be a heterogeneous, uh, or excuse me, a homogeneous mixture, where um, you get a complete random mixture of the particles in the gas mixture. The total pressure um, of the container would just be the sum of the pressures that each gas would have if it were alone in the container. So you could you know, perhaps think about air, um, that the pressure of air is due to the pressure that's due to the nitrogen, due to the pressure due to the oxygen, plus the pressure due to the argon and the other components of the atmospheres. And if you could take everything out of the atmosphere, then you would have that partial pressure of nitrogen, which is then be the, the, the pressure of the atmosphere. So the pressure of air is just the sum of all the components that make up air. And we could keep going with other smaller components like water vapor, CO2, et cetera. So the total pressure is just the sum of each of the individual partial pressures. And those pressures are just the normal pressures you would calculate using the ideal gas law. Like you can imagine that the pressure of one would just be equal to, you know, from PV is equal to NRT. This would just be the, the moles of one times the ideal gas constant times the temperature divided by the volume of the container. And so these are just related to the moles of the given components of the mixture. If you have a gas mixture, they're going to be at the same temperature and the same volume container as each other. So the temperature and volume for the entire mixture are the same because they're in the same container at the same temperature. And so if we then look at the, the gas mixture as each of the particles acting as if it's alone, we can then relate sort of relationship between partial pressures to the total. So you can take the partial pressure of a component of the mixture, let's say the partial pressure of one, you can divide that by the total pressure and then we could express partial pressure one like we just did, N1 RT divided by V. The total pressure would be the total number of moles times RT divided by V. They both have the same gas constant. They're both at the same temperature. They're both in the same volume container, so those are all canceling out. So our partial pressure of our component one over the total pressure is just equal to the ratio of the moles of each of the components. So we'd have N1 over the total number of moles. So that's our one of our sort of uh, relationships, relationships between partial pressures is the partial pressure of one of our components times the total is just equal to N1 over the total. Now, we can define the mole fraction to be that moles of a component over the total moles. So the ratio of moles of a substance compared to the total moles is the mole fraction. So the fraction that is compound one would be the moles of compound one over the total moles. It's a simple ratio. And so then that's N1 over NT. So then we can rewrite and rearrange that the partial pressure of one of the components is the mole fraction of that component times the total pressure. And so this here is like Dalton's law of partial pressures. So it's just a relationship of the mole fraction compared to the total pressure to calculate the individual partial pressure. 
Dalton's law of partial pressures. And we'll see some problems where we can relate the total moles versus the moles of each of the components and maybe use an equation that looks like um, Dalton's law of partial pressures. So let's look at a couple of moles. So what's the total pressure of a mixture of five grams of helium and five grams of oxygen in a 15 liter vessel? So we have a couple of ways we can think about this problem. We could imagine our total pressure would be due to the pressure of helium plus the pressure of oxygen. And we could calculate the partial pressure of helium, the partial pressure of oxygen, and then just simply sum them together. Um, or we could calculate the total pressure by taking the total number of moles times RT divided by V. It's kind of two approaches. Neither one, um, you know, both of them can equally be used to get the same answer. Um, I'm going to choose to use this approach here just so we can calculate and see what each of the individual partial pressures is uh, for these two gases. So my partial pressure of helium will just be the moles of helium. And so the moles of helium, 5.00 grams. And then using its molar mass, helium is 4.0 something. 4.003. And then times RT. So 5 divided by 4.003, a little over a mole, times 0 0.08206, times 298, and then divide by 15. It gives me 2.04 ATM. Partial pressure of oxygen probably going to be a little bit lower because we have less moles of oxygen, 5.00 grams, 32.00 grams per mole for the molar mass of O2 times RT. I'll just do that and then divide by the same volume. So we're taking 5 grams, divide by 32, so it's 0.156 moles times 0.0. 8206 times 298 divide by 15 it's 0.255 and we just need to add them up so our total pressure is the sum of these and I get 2.29 ATM. So here we're just calculating, you know, so if helium were in this container by itself, its pressure would be 2.04 ATM. If oxygen were in the container by itself, its pressure would be 0.255 ATM. And so the total pressure is just the two values added together. So there's this technique, and I can't remember. Did you guys do this in lab? You, like, lab's weird this year since we're doing the renovation project and ending early. But this is a typical, typical experiment we would do. Did you guys happen to take a bulb and fill it with a liquid and vaporize it? Um, if we were back like full, like with our labs fully open, we probably would have done this experiment. Um, so the idea of this experiment is you take a bulb like this, um, and y you have it at room temperature, you weigh it out, you put some liquid, you put maybe like, five or 10 milliliters of a liquid inside of the bulb. Um, the liquid, generally, you'd want to choose a liquid or you'd be given an unknown that has a boiling point below that of water. So then the idea would be you could place that container, has a little escape in it, has a you know, um, hole in the top that the material can vaporize in the boiling water bath and then leave the cell. And so then you simply wait for all of the, um, all of the liquid to vaporize into its gas form and escape the cell. And so then at that point, the cell's pretty well submersed in water, 
so that the entire cell is at the temperature of boiling water, so 100 degrees C, and then the liquid's completely vaporized out of the cell, and then as it's vaporizing, it's pushing all the air out too. So then the idea would be that the entire pressure um, in this container would be at atmospheric pressure, and then the moles would be just due to the liquid that had vaporized. And the idea, idea would be that the vaporization of the gas just like pushed all the air out and displaced the air molecules. And so then you have, a, and then you would also know the volume. One of the things we used to do is you would fill the entire cell with water and then you'd dump the water into like a graduated cylinder and see how much water there was. And, so you, and, and then from the density of water you could calculate, or actually you just wanted the volume, you don't need the mass of water. But from like the graduated cylinder marking you can figure out what the volume of that bulb was. And so you would calculate the volume of the cell some way so that you would know the volume of the gas. You would know that it's just at atmospheric pressure because the, the gas inside the cell is open to the atmosphere, so it would be at atmospheric pressure. Um, and then all the moles inside that container are due to that vaporized liquid. And so let's look at the problem and see what we're told here. So in this um, Dumas bulb te uh, technique, a uh, uh, sample of liquid is vaporized in a boiling water bath, and we can do this to determine the molar mass of that liquid. And the way we can ultimately determine that molar mass is from that relationship, the pr pressure times volume, m over molar mass times RT. And so if we know the pressure that that gas is at, if we know the volume of the cell, we know the temperature is that of boiling water, we know how much um, mass is in the cell. Now how do we know how much mass the gas is occupying in the cell? Well, once we take the cell out of water, once we finish the experiment, we let the gas um, condense back into its uh, liquid form. And so we probably started with 10 mils of liquid in the container. Most of it vaporized. We might be left with like half a milliliter or so of the liquid that revaporizes, or excuse me, recondenses. Then we just go take a mass once we dry that cell off and get a mass of the liquid that's in the container. So we have a mass of the cell before, mass of the cell after the experiment's completed so we can figure out the mass of the gas that then had recondensed inside the cell. So we have the mass here of our empty clean bulb. We have the mass of the bulb filled with liquid. So here we put a, actually about five grams of liquid into the cell. Then we take a mass of the bulb after all the liquid vaporized at 100 degrees C. And then the gas that remained in the cell reliquified. So that mass is 112.46. And so the mass of the, um, of the sample of that liquid that had remained in the cell would be 112.46. So after we complete the experiment, how much liquid revaporized, and then minus 111.34 for the clean, dry uh, bulb. So that gives us a mass of 1.12 grams. So this is the mass of the gas that was occupying that cell at 100 degrees C. So we're given the volume of the bulb in cubic centimeters. Of course, that's just a milliliter, which would make this 0.3553 liters, because we're going to plug into the ideal gas law. And then it would be typical that you would use a barometer to measure the pressure. So we're told the pressure in millimeters of mercury. Um, but we're going to use the usual constants of R. So we're going to uh, convert this 760 millimeters of mercury in an ATM. So it's 1.015 ATM. All right, so I think we can rearrange for molar mass in our expression here. So molar mass would be equal to MRT divided by PV. So then we're plugging in 1.12 grams times 0 0.08206. We're at 100 degrees C, which is 373 Kelvin. Then we're at 
0.015 ATM in a 0.3553 liter vessel. So what cancels, ATM cancels, Kelvin cancels, liter cancels, and we're left with grams per mole for our molar mass units. So we get 95.06 grams per mole. <coughs> so we can use the ideal gas law in a problem like this, or a technique like this, to determine molar masses of a, um, of a sample. So there are not a lot of easy ways to determine molar mass, but this is an experimental technique that you can use to determine the molar mass of a sample. And so what this experiment relies on is the sample being a liquid, it vaporizing, vaporizing below 100 degrees C, so you can put it in a boiling water bath. Um, it relies on us knowing like the atmospheric pressure on the day we do the experiment. Um, and then also relies on us being able to quantify how much of the re-condensed uh, liquid remains in that bulb. Okay, so this is another technique or application of the ideal gas law. Okay, so the remaining few sections in chapter 10 start to relate to things like why do gases behave the way they do, um, how can we understand effusion diffusion, things like that, um, and then also can we understand real gases. So we just get a little bit more into the theory of the behavior of gases. And so the kinetic molecular theory of gases tries to describe gases that they're in random motion. So if you imagine a container filled with a gas, the particles are always moving around uh, with a random set of velocities. They're bouncing into each other. Uh, they're bouncing into the walls of the container. You can imagine them bouncing into the walls of the container are ultimately responsible for what we think of as pressure. Um, it's that force those molecules are exerting on the walls of the container that um, directly leads to the concept of pressure. The um, gas particles themselves do not occupy much of the space of the volume of a container. If you said, like, how much space is actually, actually occupied by the particles of air, it's not much of the space because the air molecules are fairly well separated from each other. So the particles themselves are occupying a neg negligible portion of the container that they're um, occupying. And there's also negligible attractive forces, meaning if you have oxygen, nitrogen molecules, they're not attracted together and sticking together and flying around as like a dimer. They're, if, they, if they bounce into each other, they just bounce off like billiard balls. We can describe the, the constant average kinetic energy, but if you look at a gas mixture, the kinetic energy of the particles, which you can think kinetic energy is one half mv squared, that the average kinetic energy of a sample is constant. You might have some slow moving particles, you might have some fast moving particles, but there's a conservation of energy that goes on. So if a slow moving particle is struck by a fast moving particle, then maybe the fast particle slows down, the slower one speeds up, but there's a conservation of energy. We're not losing energy or creating energy through those collisions. So the total energy that we have for a gas mixture is constant. And so we might have some particles colliding and changing their velocities, um, but that those velocities are just changing in, in sort of tandem with another particle changing its velocity. The average kinetic energy itself is related to temperature. So if we can change the temperature of a sample, if we can imagine increasing the temperature, what that does is it increases the kinetic energy. So by increasing the temperature, we increase the kinetic energy. If we increase the kinetic energy, it means we're increasing the velocity of the particles. So the way temperature has an impact on a gas sample is it increases that average kinetic energy, makes the particles move around on average faster. And then they can hit the particle walls more often, giving the container a higher pressure. We might remember that as you go to a higher temperature, that pressure and temperature from the ideal gas law directly related. So if you increase the temperature, you increase the pressure. You're increasing the pressure because the particles are moving around faster. They then have a higher collision rate with the walls of the container. They're exerting then more of a force on the walls of the container. <coughs> 
So again, molecules can collide, but energy has to be conserved in the process. And that just means that um, the energy is not disappearing through a collision or energy isn't being created through the collision, it's just being exchanged between the particles. So when a gas is compressed at a constant temperature, which statement do we think is correct? So let's look at these statements here. So we're imagining a gas being compressed. So I, when I think of a gas being compressed, I like to think of a piston moving downward. Maybe we're pushing it downward. So we're compressing a gas at constant temperature. And so if we change from this volume here, and then we're changing it to this volume here by pressing down on the container, did we change the collision rate with the particles and the walls of the container? So the frequency collision of particles with the container walls increases when we compress a gas. This is definitely true. So that when we're changing the volume, we're keeping the same number of particles. So if we had, you know, six particles in the container, we still have six particles in the container. And so those six particles are going to hit the walls of the container more often now. And so we're going to have more collisions with the walls of the container. That should then be the direct reason why the pressure goes up is because we have more collisions with those container walls. And so this should lead our pressure to increase. But then the average velocity of the particles increases. Do we change the average velocity of the particles just by compressing a gas? Do we make the particles on average move faster? And the answer there is no. The only way we can change the velocity of the particles would be to change the temperature. So to increase the average velocity of the particles, we have to increase the temperature, but we're told we're at constant temperature. So the only statement here that would be true is that we're changing the collision wall frequency of uh, collisions, and we're not changing the average velocity of the particles. So one of the things that we can take a closer look at are what those average velocities of uh, a gas sample looks like, is it actually turns out a gas sample has a wide range of velocities. And so if we look at how fast gas par particles are moving, let's just focus maybe on the, the zero degree curve first. But at zero degrees, you see that we have a wide range of velocities. And this is for, I believe, hydrogen, I think is the gas that's being shown here. But it doesn't matter what the gas is. Let's just imagine this is hydrogen. So a sample like H2 gas or whatever the gas is, you see some particles have a really slow velocity. Some particles are traveling with an incredibly high velocity. Um, up to uh, 10 times 100, up to 1,000 meters per second. So we have some particles traveling 1,000 meters per second. Some particles are only traveling 10 or 20 or so meters per second. We have a wide range of velocities. We often call this distribution like a Boltzmann distribution, where we get this wide range of uh, velocities. So um, at one of the, th the things you can also see from this distribution is that it's not a perfect parabola. So we have like a uh, unequal distribution. So we have more, if you look at the maximum point here, you have more particles are on the faster side than you have on the slower side. So we have an unequal or an unweighted distribution. So let me zoom in on this curve here. So we have a few different points that we can identify. One is the most probable velocity. That's the velocity at which most of the particles, the highest percentage of molecules are traveling. And so that's our most probable velocity. We have our average velocity, which is just the simple average. If we took an average of all the molecules, what's the average velocity? So just imagine adding up each one of the molecules' velocities, dividing by the total number of molecules. You see that's a little bit on the faster side, meaning we have, on average, a particle velocity that's a little bit higher than that most probable point. And then we have another point that's interesting. Um, it's a little bit hard to describe, but it's the root mean square velocity is the speed um, at which the molecule has the average kinetic energy that you can calculate from 1 half mv squared. And so the speed of the molecules whose kinetic energy is equal to the average or mean kinetic energy of the molecules is this RMS point here. And so the VRMS is something we can calculate. I think this equation is below, but it's the square root of 3RT divided by molar mass. Let me zoom out and see if this was. OK, it just describes the points here. So the most probable peak, the average peak, and the root mean square peak. And then the most probable velocity is equal to 2RT divided by the molar mass. So we can calculate from the ideal gas constant, the temperature, and the molar mass of a gas what these velocities actually are for a given gas sample and relate them to the ideal gas law.
Okay, so this also is going to require that we go back and redefine R. So we're going to have to take a look back at R because if we recall, liter ATM per mole Kelvin is not in SI units. We're going to probably want to calculate velocities with the unit we understand, probably SI units. So we're going to have to redefine R to be the version that's in SI units. But let's also take a look back at this curve here where we're comparing the zero versus 100 degree temperature. So what happens when you increase the temperature of a gas sample is you increase the average kinetic energy, you increase the RMS point. So we're increasing all these points here for our gas sample by increasing the temperature. So if we increase the temperature, the particles have more uh, energy to distribute to their velocities, so their velocities on average become higher. So our most probable velocity is higher, our average velocity is higher, and our root mean square velocity is now higher when we increase the temperature. So this is just, again, this is kind of just resuming in on the previous slide here of just comparing the increase of temperature and then comparing the most probable average and root mean square velocities. Now this slide here is comparing uh, some different gases. Actually, I think that previous slide was N2 or O2 or something. But what this slide is comparing is the average distribution of velocities we see for different gases. Now why might you see different velocities for different gases? Well, if you start thinking at a given temperature, all gas samples have kind of the same average kinetic energy to distribute. So temperature is just a measure of kinetic energy. So if at a given temperature, a sample has the same energy to distribute, if the sample's really light particles, then the particles can travel very fast because they have that energy to distribute across a light particle. So a light particle has then a higher kinetic energy. So if we have a light particle, we can have a fast velocity. And then if you also imagine having a slightly more massive molecule or particle compared to H2, so helium's twice the molar mass of H2, so it travels with a lower average velocity. Water's more massive, N2, even more O2 of these molecules is the most massive, 32 grams per mole, so it has the slowest velocities on average. So if you have a heavier particle, its velocities on average are traveling slower, but that's because they have the same kinetic average kinetic energy at the same temperature to distribute among their molecules. And so we can also calculate this, and we can go through a couple calculations where you, know, you can calculate a root mean square velocity. Again, that's the square root of 3RT divided by molar mass. And if you imagine taking this equation here and increasing the molar mass, then what you're going to ultimately do is reduce the root mean square velocity. So the root mean square velocity is going to decrease if we increase the molar mass. But also, if you imagine increasing the temperature, then you increase the velocity. So temperature and root mean square velocities, or just velocities in general, are directly related to each other. And then the molar masses are inversely related to each other. So our velocity inversely related to the square of molar mass, and then directly related to the square of temperature. And then the most probable, again, was just a similar equation, but 2RT divided by molar mass. So I mentioned we need a, a, a set of, uh, a, a set of, we need to redefine R or recalculate R or consider its units probably just simply where they're in SI units would be the simple thing. If we want to get a velocity in meters per second, which is SI units, we probably want to plug in R in some sort of set of SI units. So let's look back at how we defined R for liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin, and then consider how we might redefine it here to, to be a value in SI units. So before, if you remember, we took a mole of an ideal gas because we knew an ideal gas had a certain volume at STP, where STP is zero degrees C, which is 273.15 Kelvin. and uh, one ATM, and exactly one ATM. And so what we had done for liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin was we had that it was one ATM times that volume divided by um, the, the, the moles being one mole, and then the temperature is 273.15 Kelvin. What we're going to do here is say, well, the SI unit of pressure is Pascal. And so that's our SI unit of pressure. And then if we recall, 1 ATM is equal to 101.325 Pascals exactly. 
So if uh, we're taking STP, so at STP and ATM would be 101.325 Pascal. That's gonna occupy 22.414 liters, but the liter's not an SI unit, cubic meters is. So we convert liters to cubic meters, and then we divide by mole, that is the SI unit, and we keep dividing by Kelvin, that's of course the SI unit as well. And so when we do this math, in fact, we can, we see the answer, but I'm just making sure that we get the right answer. I don't know why I'm recalculating this. But we get 8.314. So we get 8.314 pascals per cubic meter, or excuse me, pascal times cubic meters per mole Kelvin. So that's like our liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. So cubic meters per pascal, mole Kelvin. Now, if we then recall that the pascal, being an SI unit of pressure, like a pascal, is equal to a kilogram meter to the minus one, second to the minus two. So imagine taking that as your Pascal and then multiplying it by cubic meters. Do you see how that goes? The kilogram meter squared per second squared. So this becomes kilograms meter squared per second squared. And that is a joule. And so that's how the SI units of R kind of change into the units of 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. But hopefully what you can see here is that the underlying units of joules are meter squared per second squared. And that's where ultimately meters per second is going to fall out of this equation when we're trying to calculate a root mean square velocity using this set of constants for R. So let's try to calculate the root mean square velocity of the gas particles in an H2 gas sample at 25 degrees C in meters per second. So our VRMS, the equation, 3RT divided by molar mass. And let's think about what we want our units to be in here. So we're going to take the square root of 3 times R. Temperature, of course, is going to go to Kelvin, so it's 298 Kelvin. And now, what unit do you think we want our molar mass in? Well, let's just look at the joule again. So the joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. I want the molar mass in kilograms per mole. So I have to plug the molar mass in units of kilograms per mole. And so for H2, it's 2.016 grams per mole. So I'm going to go 0 0.002016 kilograms per mole. So I do kilograms, so the kilogram cancels here, Kelvin cancels, and then the per mole cancels. And then I'm left with the square root of meter squared per second squared of the units that are left. So if I do 8 times, or excuse me, if I do 3 times 8.314 times 298, divide by 0.002016. Before I take the square root, I would have this value as 36868863. And I just want us to see that the units are meters squared per second squared. That I have to like plug the units in a certain way or they're not going to cancel out. So I have to plug all these units here in, in SI units in order to get SI units out here. If I left the molar mass as 2.016 grams per mole, then you know grams doesn't cancel into kilograms, so then I'm really having this in some other unit. So I take the square root. and I get 1920 meters per second. You see I'm just taking the square root of the units to get meters per second.
OK, so this, if you ask me, if this question is on the final, and I don't know if it will be, but it has been before, um, and it's a unit problem. It, it's a problem where you just have to be in tune with the units. You have to show the, either show the units or just know. I'm just putting everything in SI units so I can understand the unit out from my Riemann square velocity should also be in SI units. If we plug R or T or molar mass in any other unit, then I'm calculating a speed, just not in a unit that I understand. It's just you get a velocity just in some unit that who knows what it is. Okay, so 1920 meters per second. And trust me, when this question has been on the final and the scores come back, it's usually like 30 to 40% of the class getting the problem right. How many people are here today? 30, 40%. So hopefully you guys have that advantage built in and anyone listening to this lecture at some point, really easy problem. Almost every problem in this chapter can be made really easy by showing units, but also really hard if we just like miss the units and like make a mistake or don't realize how the units are working out. Okay, so um, probably a good stopping point would be here today because it's a different topic and there's not much debt we can make in two or three minutes. But we'll pick up with a fusion and diffusion um, when we start class on Monday. So have a great weekend, everybody. Enjoy the football game.